Thank you for inviting me to the wonderful city of Sibiu and to the already fifth meeting of this wonderful Romanian-German collaboration. I want to talk today to you about prevention and screening of Barrett's esophagus. Why do I do that? Because at least in our department, early cancer, early Barrett's cancer is the primary indication for endoscopic removal of malignancy. It's by far more frequent than gastric or rectal cancer to be removed endoscopically. Barrett's esophagus is known since 1950. Norman Barrett has published it shortly after the Second World War. And this is an example of a Barrett's esophagus, of a long segment Barrett, as you might know it all. So what are the risk factors? And how can we prevent it? We can prevent Barrett's esophagus simply by reducing our body weight. There is a clear study showing that the body mass index is correlated with the risk of Barrett. In a huge population study of, uh, of uh, 65 patients, followed up for more than one decade. Interestingly enough, also body height is correlated with the prevalence of Barrett. Unfortunately enough, we can't change it. I can't move further up and you can't move further down. So uh, huge body weight is um, correlated with less Barrett than a smaller uh, body height. And that holds true for men and women, and it also holds true for Barrett and for Barrett's carcinoma. So that should be a true correlation. OK, most of you know that the general uh, prevalence of Barrett is roughly between 1 and 2%. In this population-based study from North Sweden, where a random sample of 1,000 inhab inhabitants were endoscoped, 1.6% of these, uh, not patients, but people, did have Barrett's esophagus. Of course, reflux symptoms were more intensively correlated with Barrett than no reflux symptoms. Alcohol, more than 50 grams per week, resulted in a 50% prevalence of Barrett, whereas less alcohol did not reduce it to zero, but to 26%. Smoking also was strongly correlated with Barrett. PPI use maybe is not correlated with, but it's an epiphenomenon due to treatment of reflux. In this study, NSRR, use of NSRR was not correlated with Barrett's esophagus or prevention of it. Um, there are several studies on PPIs. Uh, I have, uh, I have uh, selected the biggest one with nearly 10,000 Barrett patients from Denmark and followed up for 10 years. And interestingly enough, with a high compliance with PPI and use for more than seven years, carcinoma or high-grade dysplasia risk was much higher than in those with a low compliance of PPI. Strong data show us that non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs might reduce the risk of Barrett's carcinoma. Never users have a high risk. Former users have an increased risk over the time. And current users have a much lower risk of Barrett's carcinoma. This is another study on the same matter showing the same results 
NSA Air uses um, have uh, uh, this is this is vice versa. These are those without NSR air and those are with NSR air. It's a significant difference. Aspirin was not protective in this case control study again from Denmark. Some some years ago, statins were accused to maybe cause bears carcinoma or high-grade dysplasia. Some others argued it might be preventive. Again, in this uh, case control study, nearly 10,000 patients from Denmark starting use and controls showed the same risk of Barrett's carcinoma or high-grade dysplasia. Okay, that's for the prevention. How shall we screen for Barrett? Cytosponge was introduced eight years ago. However, to my best knowledge, it's not used really worldwide. Um, it's a, a new technique, and you can sample a tissue, of course, and can examine that. Maybe we have the same problems than with fine needle aspiration by EUS. However, it's an attractive alternative to endoscopy. One important point is subsquamous Barrett's esophagus. And very recently, this year in March or February, Bartle and co-workers published their series on more than 100 patients with proven Barrett's esophagus. And they did a study performing biopsies um, 10 millimeters proximal to the squamocolumnar junction and 5 millimeters proximal to the squamocolumnar junction. And very interestingly, they had a high prevalence of Barrett below, beneath the, the, the squamous epithelium in these two areas. It was 18 or 19 percent at one centimeter proximal to the squamocolumnar junction. So subsquamous Barrett might be uh, a point where we should be very cautious in diagnosing or excluding Barrett's esophagus. How sh should we screen for dysplasia or carcinoma? Of course, usually by random biopsies. And Keep in mind the subsquamous Barrett. Biopsy samples, according to the recent European guideline, as most of you might know, should be taken from all visible mucosal abnormalities. In addition, random four-quadrant biopsies should be collected every two centimeters within the Barrett's segment. With respect to the recent study, with subsquamous Barrett, I would add that you should also biopsy at least one centimeter proximal to the squamocolumnar junction. And of course, these biopsies should be collected in separate containers. Do we have other measures to improve our biopsy techniques? Is there an endoscopic red flag technology we recently use uh, LCI modus by Fujinon, and this is the case I showed you as an example for a long segment Barrett. And in fact, in this area, by LCI modus, you could clearly detect some abnormality. However, the technique is still new, and uh, there are no big data comparing white light endoscopy with these new techniques. Of course, incidence of carcinoma is much higher in long segment Barrett than in short and ultra short segment Barrett, as shown by Pohl and co-workers who did put together their Wiesbaden cohort, the largest one in the world, population-based data of Germany, and published uh, results. <laughs> 
Of their more than 1,000 patients with T1 carcinoma referred for endoscopic resection, more than half of them had the T1 carcinoma within the lung segment buried. About one-fourth had it in the short segment, but also several, several people had it in the ultra-short segment uh, buried esophagus. To detect one carcinoma in Barrett patients, you will have to do, that's the, the estimation by Paul and co-workers, you will have to do the amount of 450 endoscopies in long segment Barrett's patients. With short segment, you will need more than 3,000 endoscopies to, to detect one carcinoma, and with ultra short segment, the incredible amount of more than 12,000 endoscopies will be required to detect one patient with a carcinoma per year. So the actual, the, the recent surveillance uh, recommendations by the ESGE say that patients with a long segment barrett of more than 10 centimeters should be referred for surveillance endoscopy to specialized centers. Long segment parents, three to nine centimeter, should be uh, surveyed by endoscopy every three years, and one to two centimeter parents every five years. And there is no recommendation to, uh, for surveillance in ultra short parent. A very important point has to be made about the risk of carcinoma over time in Barrett's patients. It does not decrease over time, as a recent publication last year showed. The risk keeps stable over the many, many years, so you should basically never stop surveillance. And another important part is what I always teach my young uh, gastroenterologists, the location of Barrett's neoplasia is not uniformly distributed. There is a strict prevalence in the one to two o'clock position. So that's the position where most of the malignant uh, Barrett's neoplasias will develop. What shall we do if we will have low-grade dysplasia at a random biopsy, mostly done as an outpatient. If there was no visible lesion, the patient shall be re-evaluated at six months, with negative results subsequently every year. And according to the ESGE guideline, ablation by thermoablation by any method of the Barrett can be considered in these cases. If you will find high-grade dysplasia at random biopsy, again, if you don't have a visible lesion, you should re-evaluate the patient in a specialized center. And this was a case referred to our department. We could uh, detect the lesion, which typically was in the two o'clock position, and of course, we could resect it by EMR. If you don't find a visible lesion with high-grade or early cancer, high-grade dysplasia or early cancer at random biopsy, of course you have to re-evaluate this patient very carefully. And if even in a specialized center you can't see any lesion, the Barrett's uh, esophagus should be ablated, ablated completely. If you find a visible lesion, lesion and you did have high-grade dysplasia or carcinoma, you should again resect it in a center like this one, this case performed last year in our unit. If it's a bigger lesion, like here, you can, of course, perform ESD in the esophagus and resect the lesion completely and close it. Okay, to summarize my talk, how can we prevent Barrett's esophagus? Reduce overweight, overweight, reduce alcohol, abstinence from nicotine. PPI might not be helpful, so they should be prescribed as usual on demand. 
NSAR are not negative. They have the best uh, uh, data for being a little bit protective. Statins and aspirin have no clear benefit. There is currently no recommendation to be given on the prevention of cancer in patients with Barrett's esophagus. This is the current German guideline. For the screening, a screening, a general population screening of Barrett is not recommended actually. It can be considered if you have a patient with long-lasting gastroesophageal reflux disease of more than five years, in patients with an age of more than 50 years, in men, in overweight people, and in patients with relatives with Barrett. And whom should we screen for Barrett's carcinoma? I think according to the new data, which I showed you, surveillance intervals should be according to the length of the Barrett's esophagus, and ultra-long Barrett should be surveyed in specialized centers. I thank my team in Bamberg, and I thank you here in Shibiu, where I was two years ago and had a wonderful open-air opera, like we will, might be have this evening. Thank you very much.